This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Friday, November 1st. This is Africa 54. The president of Seychelles pleads for action on climate change. House Democrats formalize the Trump impeachment inquiry. We'll explain what the vote means and where the investigations go from here. And in our entertainment segment, boundary-busting world music icon, Rachid Taha. We'll have those stories in a moment, but first, the United Nations says record global greenhouse gas emissions are putting the world on a path toward an acceptable warming with serious implications for development prospects in Africa. Small island nations are among the most vulnerable to climate change, and many are fighting the effects of a warming planet, but say they cannot succeed alone. VOA's Arashar Basadi heads to island waters for this story. Off the coast of Aldabra Island, in the blue waters of the Seychelles, blooms a rebirth of life. We saw some truly amazing and unique environments, really pristine condition coral reefs uh, that we were not expecting to see in some locations. Here at the Necton Foundation in Oxford, England, researchers look at how local islands reverse damage from climate change. The scientists have spoken. We all know that we have a problem. What is needed is responsible global action. Danny Four is president of the Seychelles. The nation is currently on track to protect almost one-third of its waters by next year. It is a privilege to address you, citizens of the world. And of course, there were other locations president Four recently visited the lab in Oxford where scientists analyzed data they collected over 300 deployments to the Indian Ocean. There was an incredible diversity and abundance of fish, especially in protected areas like Aldabra, which shows that marine protected areas do work when they are put in place. There are more and bigger fish in protected waters, and scientists say that points to a healthier ecosystem. President Ford says larger nations should follow the Seychelles' success in working to reverse the damage caused by climate change. I believe with the decision on the protected marine areas, once it's finalized, we as a country will be in a position scientifically to say, this is, this is how we measure, and this is the difference. Cleanup crews on just this one island collected almost 26 metric tons of trash. The move to protect the environment here also protects major economic drivers of fishing and tourism. Arash Arbasadi, VOA News, Washington. Somalia's federal government and UN aid agencies are seeking humanitarian assistance for hundreds of thousands of Somalis affected by some of the heaviest floods in years. A government emergency committee said flooding caused by heavy rains sent water over the banks of the Juba and Shabele rivers. The town most affected is Beletwen in the Hiran region, north of Mogadishu, where at least 10 people lost their lives. Government officials said thousands of local who, locals who formed makeshift camps on high ground are in desperate need of food and water. Now, local doctors are warning that mosquito-borne diseases like malaria could become a problem after flooding. In the Central African Republic, heavy floods have killed at least five people and displaced more than 35,000 from their homes, according to the International Red Cross. The country's prime minister announced on Monday that more than 20,000 people lost their homes when the Obangi River burst its banks. Residents say they had not seen such flooding in the last 10 years. The heavy rains have caused many schools to close. Red Cross coordinator for Central Africa, Antoine Baobogo, said many people were seeking shelter in their friends' homes, but thousands of others have nowhere to go. A temporary shelter was set up in the capital, Bangui's basketball stadium. But health officials fear there will be a rise in waterborne diseases due to lack of basic facilities such as toilets and cooking areas. To West Africa now, where a committee initially designed to protect residents from robberies in the Senegalese border town 
has taken on a new purpose in the wake of jihadist violence in neighboring Mali. Isha Sarai reports from Moderi. In 2010, when Mudehri inaugurated their Committee of Vigilance, its purpose was mostly to identify unknown people who may potentially rob homes in the wealthy river Senegalese town. Since we started this committee, thank God, robberies have decreased. Why? Because there's an anticipation. They anticipate our presence on the ground. Every night we carry out our patrols. Not far from the border with Mali, Mouderi is situated directly on the river that divides Senegal and Mauritania, and residents feared that criminals could easily flee to the other side of the border. Because of our geographic situation, a criminal from Mauritania can easily flee here. So someone could also commit a crime here, cross the river, and be safe from prosecution. Their system for reducing crime in the village worked so well that members of the UN's migration organization identified their program as a model for more border towns to secure their communities against the threat of jihadist violence. They could come here to propagate Islam and recruit young people to be with them in the mosques. We were afraid of this. We were seeing it happen everywhere. We have mosques here. We're all Muslim. But we said, okay, we already have our vigilance committee and we can work with the IOM to watch our borders in collaboration with national security forces. The committee is also registered with Senegal's interior ministry, partially to keep it accountable. Our committee is not a law enforcement agency and it's not a militia. It's just a group of young people who want to secure their homes. And as the threats to their town evolve, Mouderi's committee and their sister committees in neighboring villages appear ready to evolve as well. Isha Sarai, VOA News, Mouderi, Senegal. The Democratic-controlled U.S. House of Representatives formalized the impeachment inquiry into U.S. President Donald Trump Thursday. They passed a resolution along party lines setting up procedures for the next phase of the investigation. VOA's congressional correspondent Catherine Gibson has more from Capitol Hill. A historic moment in the U.S. Congress. The yeas are 232, the nays are 196. That also showed the deep party divides over President Trump. Republicans all voted against the measure. All but two House Democrats voted for it. The move formalizes weeks of closed-door investigations into allegations Trump pressed Ukraine to investigate political rival Joe Biden and his son and ordered hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to that country frozen as a way to pressure that country's leader. The move to make Trump the fourth president to face an impeachment inquiry was not taken lightly, said Speaker Pelosi. What is at stake is our democracy. What are we fighting for? Defending our democracy for the people. Trump tweeted immediately after the vote, calling the investigation a witch hunt. Presidential impeachments are inseparable from politics, but Democrats maintain the investigation as part of their duty as lawmakers. For all the disagreements I have with President Trump, for all his policies, his tweets, and his rhetoric that I deeply disagree with, I never wanted our country to reach this point. I do not take any pleasure in the need for this resolution. We are not here in some partisan exercise. We are here because the facts compel us to be here. The president's congressional allies dismissed this argument. Clearly, there are people that we serve with that don't like the results of the 2016 election. It should not be Nancy Pelosi in a small group of people that she selects that get determined who's going to be our president. Republicans argue the new impeachment rules are still deeply unfair to President Trump. It's not a fair process. It's not an open process. It's not a transparent process. But instead, it's limited and a closed process with a preordained outcome. Public hearings are expected to begin in mid-November, likely followed by a vote on articles of impeachment that would almost certainly pass the Democratic majority House. But the resulting trial in the Republican majority Senate would favor Trump. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Capitol Hill. Now, for more perspective on the president on President Trump's impeachment investigation, I'm joined in the studio by Jim Malone, VOA senior national correspondent. Jim, good to have you back. Thanks for having 24. me. Now, the resolution was passed yesterday. Right. 
where does the impeachment process go from here? So we are still closer to the beginning of this process than the end, but it's now going to be much more open process. There will be hearings in public. You will hear from the witnesses who have been making statements, basically trying to implicate the president in what Democrats believe is wrongdoing. Republicans are hanging with him saying he hasn't done anything wrong. But if this continues to move forward in the House of Representatives, we could eventually get to what we call an impeachment vote. But people should remember when they hear the word impeachment, it doesn't mean you are removing the president. Impeachment is the equivalent of an indictment, an allegation. The House does its job. It would then, if they do pass articles of impeachment, go over to the Senate. The Senate acts as jurors in a trial, and they will decide if the president stays in office or not. Now, Jim, we know that the president has dismissed his critics over the time, and he uses Twitter and even speaks about it. Should he be concerned about this particular impeachment process? So far, what we've seen is Republicans defending him. They are attacking the process the Democrats are undertaking in the Congress. They are not so much addressing the substance of the allegations that the president was pressuring the president of Ukraine to get political dirt on his rival Joe Biden. Most of them don't want to talk about that. I think eventually Republicans will be forced to talk about it, and the question will become, does it rise to what we would call the level of an impeachable offense? Is it a worthwhile violation, then, to have the president removed from office? And so far, we're not seeing a lot of Republicans believe that it is. Now, you talk about a, a, a divided house. We see the Democrats saying they're trying to protect democracy in America. The uh, Republicans saying this is an unfair process. But where does this leave the American people, given that we're heading to the 2020 presidential elections? Oh, that's a great question. And we know from the polling right now, the public at large remains split on him. Impeachment. Support for at least an impeachment inquiry or investigation has grown, as has the number of people who would like to see the president removed from office over this. It's around 50 percent in some polls. But the president's supporters are fairly strong, too. The country's about half and half right now. The question we want to look for is, as the investigation goes forward in the House, will the public opinion shift? Because who pays attention to that? the members of Congress that will be deciding the president's fate. They will be very much watching to see if it tips one way or the other. We saw two Democrats join the Republicans. They voted no to the resolution. Now you know from here, as you say, it's going to go to the Senate, which is controlled by the, the Republicans. What do you expect will happen? It would appear right now to be a very high bar for the Democrats to find a way to get 67 of the 100 senators to agree to convict the president on an article of impeachment and then remove him from office. That would require 20 Republican senators to come over to the Democratic side on the issue of should the president be removed. We don't see any indication of that right now. But this is what's the situation right now. We don't know moving forward what else we're going to find out, how that will affect public opinion, and how will it affect those Republican senators who would be part of the jury in the Senate if it does come to a trial. And some say some Republicans or even Democrats may not be concerned because they will not be running again. Is that a correct Yes, it's, it, impeachment's a very political process, and as you point out, it's heading into an election year. Right now, we're not talking much about the election because impeachment is dominating everything. Jim, thank you very much for you your bet. excellent analysis. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jim Malone is BOA senior national correspondent. Now, we're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, a musical tribute to Pan-Africanism. We'll be back.
Shaka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. The lyrics could be French, English, Portuguese, Bantu, Arabic, it is the beat. The African beat that counts. The beat does all the translations. It cuts across all languages and gives us the understanding that this is the African beat. It is so distinct and adhesive. It binds us together. African beat on the voice of America. For more information, visit our website at www.voanews.com slash African beat. I'm Clara Frank, and here's what's trending. Ethiopia Snefas Silk Polytechnic College offers a first-of-its-kind training program where refugees learn skills in cooking, woodwork, mechanics, and other subjects, alongside Ethiopians. The initiative was commissioned by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. It supports employment prospects in Ethiopia for both refugees and Ethiopians alike. Home to one of the largest refugee populations in Africa, Ethiopia passed a historic new refugee law in January 2019 that gives refugees the right to obtain work permits, access primary education, legally register births and marriages, and access financial services such as banking. Next up, salmon populations in the Northeast United States are in decline and man-made dams have hindered their migration back to the headwaters of the rivers where they were born in order to spawn. If they make it past predators, animal and human, they must battle their way up so-called fish ladders at the many dams and weirs blocking their route. It's for this reason Whoosh Innovations has come up with the salmon cannon. Fish are placed in one end and painlessly whizzed over the dam and deposited safely on the other side. It's hoped that the salmon cannon will contribute to a healthier salmon population for the local tribes that depend on them for food. And finally, if you ever looked at your dog and thought, I wish it was a panda, well, a pet cafe in China is selling the service. At just over $200, they'll dye puppies in black and white to resemble one of China's national symbols. The Candy Planet Pet Cafe in Chengju has gone viral over these dye jobs. The buzz around these dogs hasn't been all that warm and fuzzy. The People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals Asia vice president told Reuters that coating dogs with dyes is stressful and chemicals can trigger allergic reactions. And that's what's trending today. Now the deaths of 39 migrants, many believed to be of Vietnamese origin in the back of a refrigerated truck near London last week, has focused the spotlight on the lives of those who risk everything to earn a better living in Britain. Many Vietnamese are lured overseas by the potential profits of working in illegal industries. Henry Ridgewell has more from London. Unseen and unheard, hidden in Britain's shadow economy. Many migrants who enter Britain illegally are keen to profit from industries that are unlawful and unregulated. Tamsin Barber, an expert on Vietnamese diaspora in Britain, says many are willing to take huge risks. And they're doing that because they know that when they get to the UK, the likelihood is, is they, they're going to be able to um, find work um, in the cannabis industry where they might be able to earn large amounts of money in a short period of time paying back their debts, the debts to the smugglers, and then eventually being able to pay, uh, send remittances back to their family. As well as the illegal cannabis industry, many Vietnamese work in nail salons, which have boomed on British streets in recent years. Others work in the restaurant trade as cleaners, some in prostitution. Once here, many migrants are trapped. When they get to the UK, the debt bondage, uh, that huge debt, thirty to $40,000, uh, you know, is taken from their wages, 
uh, if they don't behave or if they don't follow instructions, there could be also ramifications for their family back in Vietnam uh, from those uh, people smuggling gangs. Some migrants endure slave-like conditions. They're scared to death that if they re are reported or somehow uh, seek out the authorities because they're being abused so badly, that all that will happen is they'll be arrested and sent back to Vietnam, still owing a large debt. Despite the risks, sending a family member overseas is often a joint decision. The methods that families might use to try and raise this sort of money, which might be selling land, um, it might be remortgaging their houses, it might be borrowing money from money lenders at very high sort of interest rates. If successful, the profits can transform communities back home. In Do Tan, south of Hanoi, rundown shacks are being replaced with luxury villas. Originally, the entirety of Do Tan commune was just farmers working in the fields. But then some people went overseas to work where they got rich. That's why many people rushed to go, both flying there legally and using illegal underground routes. That illegal route ended in tragedy for 39 migrants crossing to Britain. They're taking these dangerous routes and it's likely they're still going to continue to come um, because there's so much to be gained from, the, from, the, from their migration here in the UK. The potential profits versus the terrifying risks. Such is the dilemma facing migrants seeking a better life in Britain. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Some Islamic State supporters are starting to rally around the terror group's new leader using social media to pledge their allegiance to a man whose true identity may not be known for some time. Islamic State announced the selection of Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurashi as its new leader Thursday in an audio message issued by its Amak news agency and read by the group's new spokesman. The announcement also confirmed the deaths of ISIS self-declared Caliph Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and his spokesman Abu Hassan al-Muhajir during a raid by U.S. Special Forces last Saturday. Authorities revealed Thursday that al-Baghdadi crawled into a hole with two small children and blew himself up as U.S. forces moved in on a compound in Syria's Idlib province near the Turkish border. But in Thursday's announcement, the new ISIS spokesman Abhamza al qurashi cautioned the U.S. against rejoicing. Some analysts believe Islamic State will not be crippled by Baghdad's death. It's time for our entertainment, and joining us now is Africa 54 Music Makers host, Heather Maxwell. Happy Friday, Heather. Thank you, Esther. Happy Friday. Hello, everyone. Every week on my radio show, Music Time in Africa, Kwame Ofori joins me in presenting a Song of the Week. This one is by an artist who became famous for using the whole world as his playground for composing eclectic music. He passed away in September 2018 at age 59, but had recorded his 16th album prior to his death, which was released almost exactly one year later, September 19th, 2019. This is the first video to emerge from the album, the title track. It's a beautiful tribute to Pan-Africanism that crosses boundaries of time, place, nationality, and color. We have a song from Algeria, France, by the late Rashid Taha. It's called Je suis Africain, or I am African. African. Let's
That was Rashid, the late Rashid Taha's mm -hmm. Je Suis Africain. Mm -hmm. I'm Heather Maxwell. I'm Mr. Asante here for you now and always. And what was that, Kwame? Song oh. of, of the, the week. week. All right, that's our entertainment for this Friday. Back to you, Esther. Thank you so much, Heather. That was very refreshing. So we'll see you again next Friday. And that's our show for today. Have a very great weekend, everyone. From here, say adios. <laughs>